Welcome everybody to this Joint Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee. I'm Councillor Kieran Cromley and I'm the Chair of North Somerset Scrutiny Panel and I'll be chairing today's meeting because we do the mid-rotation and it's North Somerset's turn. So at this point I'm not going to ask officers to introduce themselves, I'll ask you to do that when we get to your items on the agenda. If that's okay, if you could introduce yourself and, and your teams. So a bit of housekeeping. So today's meeting is being live streamed on YouTube and when the meeting's over, there'll be a version that you can watch back should you wish to do so. And um, again, as a kind of a reminder, decisions that are made in this virtual medium still have the same validity as if we was all back doing it face to face. To avoid background noise, if people don't mind putting themselves on mute, and then when I call you to speak, you can unmute yourself. Um, if you do need to leave during the meeting, do let us know so we can capture that um, in, in the minutes and it's useful from a quorum perspective. And finally, when it comes to voting, I'm going to do it kind of in reverse order in, in block if we do need to vote on something. So, yeah, i.e., yeah. any abstentions, any against. Um, and then, assuming there's enough majority left, we'll assume that that's passed. Um, so, that's kind of housekeeping. Uh, any questions on housekeeping before we move to, to the meeting itself? No, nope, not that I can see. Oh, I should mention actually, how are you going to ask to speak? That would have been helpful, wouldn't it? Um, so if you would like to, to speak, you've got the uh, hands up function. So we'll be using that today. So select the hands up function and then I'll call you to speak um, once, once we're ready on that. So could I um, go to, to Leo? Um, apologies for absence. So I've got Councillor Parker, Councillor Fix, and I also have uh, Councillor Begley. And I know Ros Willis is having problems at the moment, so may not be able to join us. Are there any others, Leo, Dan, or Leo? I'm I'm not aware of any from uh, North Somerset Council. No further apologies from Bristol. Oh, Councillor Kirk, you'll need to turn, you'll need to unmute yourself. You're not you're on mute at the moment. Sorry, uh, and I don't know whether my raised hand is working. Sorry. I saw it. Yeah, I did uh, see it. Don't is worry. my raised hand work? Yeah. Excellent. Um, it's just I had a message earlier from Paul Goggins, who, for personal reasons, may be delayed in getting to the meeting from Bristol. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks. OK, um, so in that case, what we're going to do is we're going to do a bit of a, a roll call to capture who's here in this meeting. Uh, Brent, I understand you're doing the roll call for everybody. So when your name is called, if you don't mind saying present, it's a bit like school. Uh, that'd be grand. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, right, uh, Councillor Cronnelly. I was expecting to be called to see you. Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Kerry? Councillor Jacobs? Present. Thank you. Councillor James? Present. Councillor Snaden? Present. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Willis? Councillor Massey? Councillor Clough. Present. Thank you. Councillor Combley. Present. Thank you. Councillor Goggin. Uh, Councillor Kirk. Present. Thank you. Councillor Phipps. Councillor Windows. Councillor Pomfret. Present. Thank you. Councillor Begley. Councillor Griffin. Councillor Holloway. Present. Thank you. Councillor Jones. Present. Thank you. Councillor O'Neill. Present. Thank you. And Councillor Riddle. Present. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. Um, so we're just going to go to declarations of interest. Has anybody got any that they need to declare? No. Nope. Councillor Kirk, your hand's still up. Is that, um, I'm assuming that's from last time rather than declaration of interest. Perfect, thank you. Um, OK, so we'll move to chair's business. So there's none from myself. Um, are there any other chair's business from either uh, Councillor Pomfret or Councillor Massey? Nothing from myself, no, not, not in South Gloss. 
nothing from me, thank you. Perfect, okay. So we'll move to minutes. So these are the minutes from the 25th of October 2019. That's definitely a, a fair while ago. Um, so are there any inaccuracies or, or comments regarding those minutes? Nope, I'm getting nothing. Oh, gone. Uh, I did notice that Thornbury was spelt wrongly in one place. You're I'm right. Surprised, yes. I'm surprised Shirley didn't notice that. I, I had seen. I had seen it. I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to make a fuss. Um, I'm not quite sure where it is now, but it is spelt wrongly in one place. It's yes, Thornberry, right. not Thornberry. We, Chairman, we will amend. We'll check and amend and make sure that they spelt correctly. Yeah, let's not offend everybody in Thornbury. That'd be grand. Thank you. Any others? Perfect. Doesn't look like. OK, so um, could I ask then for a proposal and seconder just to confirm the accuracy of uh, these minutes? Don't all come rushing at once. There uh, you go. Proposed. Perfect. And I think I caught you as well, Sarah. Thank you for seconding. Um, OK, um, so any objections to that at all? No one's popping out at me, so I'm going to assume that they're they're fine. So they're, they're passed. Um, we'll get those amended on the Thornbury part, um, but that's fine. The next item on the agenda is public forum. I've had no statements. Is that still correct, Leo? Yes, we've had no, uh, no nobody's registered to speak. OK, excellent. Um, so the next item then is about the amendments to uh, the terms of reference. So it's it's been a fair while um, since these were last reviewed, but due to kind of the movement towards um, integrated care system, we've updated some of the language in that terms of reference. So it's kind of cosmetic more than anything, but obviously it's a, an opportunity to take a look at them. And um, what I would say um, is if anyone does have any kind of big changes they wish to make, that usually means it will have to go back to each local authorities for council. So if it's cosmetic, it's usually fine. If it's broader than that, uh, we'll have to have another conversation about that. So any questions or comments about the changes to the terms of reference? Nope. Okay. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to uh, approve those uh, amendments in those terms of references. So what I'm going to do, um, if I could have a proposer and seconder for that, and then we'll go to a vote. If you want to propose a second, you can use the hand function. I'll, I'll take those as proposals and seconds. I'm going to propose, no one's coming forward at the moment. Could someone want a second? There you go. Thank you, uh, Councillor Clough. So what we're going to do is just going to do a vote. We're going to do it in block. So is there anybody who wishes to abstain on the terms of references? Nothing's coming out on either chat or hands. Anybody wishes to vote against the change of terms of references? OK, nothing's popping out of me. Let me just quickly check the chat. No. So in that case, I'm going to take them as passed. So that's fine. So those terms of references will be adopted. Excellent. Um, OK, so we move to the, the kind of substantive part of today, really. And it's uh, the item on the agenda, BNSSG stroke program. Um, so this is going to be presented by Chris and Becca. Uh, I'm not sure which one of you are starting, but do you also mind introducing yourself and your team here as well, please? Yes, thank, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity for me and my team to come and talk to um, councillors today about uh, the stroke programme um, and the progress that we've made in thinking about um, what stroke um, uh, care might look like <clears throat> in, in the future. Um, if we go on a slide. Um, so, uh, my name's Chris Burton. Um, I'm the Medical Director of North Bristol NHS Trust, um, based at Southmead Hospital, um, and I am the Chair of the Stroke Programme Board on behalf of the Healthier Together um, Integrated Care System here in BNSSG. Um, the Programme Director um, is Becca Dunn, um, uh, who you heard referred to, and I'm joined today by 
um, a significant group of people who have worked incredibly hard um, on developing the stroke program and um, part of the reason for showing the list um, here today is just to demonstrate that this has been a real partnership um, both between health um, and people with lived experience, the charitable sector um, and also all of the health organisations in BNSSG. And I won't ask everybody to introduce themselves now, but if they, if they uh, speak later on in the presentation, then, then they'll uh, introduce who they are at that point. So if we can move on to the next slide. Um, so the reason for coming for you today um, is firstly to share progress on a programme of work that's been going for some time now. Um, we do think that the um, proposals that we will finalise um, later on in the spring or early, early summer um, will be a significant change to health provision for stroke um, in BNSSG. Um, and so we do expect um, to go to public consultation on the proposals. Um, and so uh, feedback on the consultation process that's proposed would be helpful. Um, also, um, uh, we will need to make a number of decisions as a result of the consultation process um, and we have presented today uh, a paper um, discussing the criteria that we'll use um, to evaluate um, the proposals um, to come to final decisions later in 2021. Um, we also recognise that this is happening at the time time um, that there are lecture, elections in the local community um, and therefore a perda period and therefore and then likely changes to the makeup of um, this committee um, and so we'd like uh, any advice um, or, or discussion about how this committee might be consulted in the future as we go through the consultation process. So if we can move on to the next slide uh, and the next so as I said um, a bit earlier on, this has been a programme that we've been thinking about for some considerable time. Um, and you'll hear from Phil Clatworthy, one of the lead stroke clinicians in BNSSG, that um, uh, that's come about to some extent because of significant um, changes in recent years on uh, people's view on how stroke can be most effectively treated um, and uh, in order to uh, help our healthcare system get to the point of maximising the care that we can offer for the local population has required us to consider the entirety of the um, pathway of care from the point that somebody has a stroke in the community to the point that we've maximised their recovery thereafter. Um, and that's involved a large number of different organisations and specialisms, um, which um, it has taken some time, but um, we are committed to seeing through. Next slide. So um, we know that one in 50 of the residents um, in our population are living with long term consequences of stroke. Um, and it is one of the biggest killers um, uh, of, of the population um, across the United Kingdom. So it's a really impactful and important topic and impactful in both health and social care in managing long term consequences. Um, so uh, our vision, uh, we want to prevent more strokes from happening um, and we have a whole work stream proceeding on uh, prevention of strokes so that we can um, do what we can to minimise impact. Um, but acknowledging that uh, it will never be possible to completely uh, prevent strokes, um, we want to ensure that everyone in BNSSG has the best opportunity to survive and thrive after having had a stroke. And our vision is for equitable expert care at home, in the hospital and in the community, wherever you live in BNSSG. Next slide, please. So, um, we know from the clinical evidence and experience 
elsewhere in health systems um, that we can achieve our vision and our aim for best possible care through enhancing long-term rehabilitation and therapy support um, so that everyone has the best chance of a full and independent life having had a stroke. Um, we want to make sure that every BNSSG resident has access to the most modern, highly specialised treatments such as cot removal and neurosurgery um, immediately following a stroke. Um, similar types of, of thinking to that which are the uh, centralisation of heart care and of major trauma centres um, has caused. Um, and we want to make sure that our services meet the very latest national standards for stroke care. And the next slide. So I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Phil Clapworthy, um, who's a stroke clinician here at uh, Southmead Hospital um, and who chairs the systems uh, health integration team for stroke. So over to you, Phil. Um, thanks very much, Chris, um, and, and thanks to to everyone for for the opportunity to to talk to you about what is really a very exciting plan um, for the region. Um, so this slide really is about introducing what the the challenge is um, with stroke. So uh, more than 100,000 strokes happen in the UK every year, um, which is about one every five minutes, and more than 1,500 of these are in the BNSSG region. Um, and because the population is aging, as everybody knows, this is increasing uh, rapidly as in this, uh, the upper figure um, shows the expected number of people who will be suffering a stroke um, increasing quite dramatically over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and perhaps the biggest challenge that's posed by stroke is the, the complex neurological disability that it causes. Um, so um, the success of improving stroke care over decades, um, as shown in the bottom uh, image there which shows how death rates after stroke have reduced quite dramatically over the last 20-30 years. Um, it means that a lot more people are surviving a stroke which while a, a great thing um, is a real challenge in terms of um, the the disability that people have. So two-thirds of people who've had a stroke uh, leave hospital with disability um, and about one in 50 people, as, as Chris said, um, living in BNSSG have had a stroke in the past. Um, so unfortunately, we are now armed with the tools to overcome the challenge, I think, and improve the health of our population. Um, there are lots of treatments with both strong research and real world evidence uh, for reducing death and disability after stroke. Um, so um, Jeremy, if you wouldn't mind going on to the next slide. Um, so, uh, hopefully it'll be useful for me to provide you a bit of context um, by describing some of the treatments and explaining what a stroke actually is. Um, so a stroke is a condition where part of the brain is permanently damaged by a problem with its blood supply, essentially. Um, about 90% of strokes are what we call ischemic, which means that a blood vessel is blocked um, almost always by a blood clot, um, and that starves part of the brain of oxygen. Um, and the bigger the clot and the longer it stays there, the larger the area of, of brain that dies as a consequence. 10% um, or so of strokes are hemorrhagic, and that's to say they're caused by a burst blood vessel, um, and the resulting, uh, what you might say, a bruise in the brain um, presses directly on the surrounding area of brain, um, and that damages it. Um, the next slide, please. So in terms of treatment after stroke, um, the first minutes and hours after stroke are absolutely critical. So if the right treatment's provided as soon as possible, then we can potentially reduce the amount of brain that, that dies after a stroke, putting it bluntly. Um, and that's what we call hyperacute stroke treatment. Um, for ischemic stroke, where you've got a blocked blood vessel, um, the treatment's really aimed to remove the blockage and restore, restore blood flow to the brain. Um, Thrombolysis, the, the top item on the list there, is where a clot dissolving drug is injected into a vein, and if done very early, it can reduce the amount of brain damage and remove, uh, reduce the disability caused by the stroke. Um, and about one in four ischemic strokes can be treated that way. Um, where the blood clot's very large, um, and that can be several millimetres wide and centimetre long even, um, then thrombolysis often fails to dissolve the whole blood clot uh, and the blood vessel is still blocked. Um, and that's where the, the revolutionary treatment called mechanical thrombectomy comes in, where a highly trained specialist 
um, carries out a procedure where a device is passed up from the groin to the artery in the brain to physically remove the large blood clot. Um, and again, this needs to be provided uh, absolutely as soon as possible for maximum benefits. Um, for hemorrhagic stroke, one of the key treatments is drugs into the veins to reduce blood pressure and reduce the risk of the bleed getting bigger. Um, and once those first hours have passed, um, whether or not someone's been eligible for those treatments, um, people need to be cared for on a highly by a highly trained nursing team on what we call a hyperacute stroke unit or HASU, um, where complications like pneumonia, brain swelling, DVTs can be prevented or identified and treated as soon as possible. Um, and a vital aspect of, of stroke care in general is a team approach to care. So many different health professionals are involved working together to look after the whole person after a stroke. Um, and uh, that includes people like speech therapists, physiotherapists, but also um, where people have had a very severe stroke, um, they do need access to services like neurosurgery. Um, next slide, please. Um, so after the first few days um, and while its immediate treatment is, is clearly very important, um, it's also important to remember that stroke is a long-term condition. So right from the start, uh, we have to be thinking about how we're going to support people to the best possible recovery after their stroke. Um, and even very elderly brains are capable of adapting in response to injury, provided the right care and support is provided in the right environment. Um, so we know that intensive specialist rehabilitation results in better recovery um, and that recovery happens better at home where rehabilitation can be built into everyday activities. Um, and it's also actually quite easy to forget how much time people spend sitting in an acute hospital uh, without any real meaningful activity, um, even if we are meeting guidelines for rehabilitation. Um, and what's become more and more apparent over recent years, um, at least to health professionals, stroke survivors have known this for a very long time, um, is that people can experience meaningful recovery over years and years after a stroke. Um, and the conversations we've had with people who've had direct experience of stroke locally has really reinforced that. Um, and as if that wasn't complicated enough, um, stroke is, of course, a major life event um, and often a life changing event. So um, as well as the impact on the individual having the stroke, it has a major impact on families um, such as roles within the family, work, income, carers, leisure activities. Um, and actually even a mild stroke can result in fatigue, fear of further stroke, cognitive impairment. So um, the personal fallout of a stroke um, like depression or breakdown of relationships um, can continue a long time after health services usually consider their jobs done. Um, next slide, please. Um, so to their great credit, NHS England really have been making big strides nationally towards improving stroke services um, and the plans that we're uh, in the process of making to improve stroke care in BNSSG um, will build on evidence of benefit from changes uh, to services in other regions already. Um, so uh, we know that treatment is delivered more efficiently and effectively in centres that treat many hundreds of people with stroke every year. Um, and stroke can happen any time, so the services need to be set up to provide a proper 24-7 responsive treat, treatment service. Um, and, uh, and where as many people as possible, not just those who are eligible for these immediate treatments, have access to specialist 24-7 care, it can reduce, re result in much better outcomes. Um, so, for example, in London, London and Manchester, um, after only reconfiguring their acute hospital services, they found quite a significant reduction in, in death, disability and the length, length of time people needed to spend in hospital. Um, there's also an appreciation uh, in NHS England about the need to emphasise rehabilitation care and support at home. Um, and there's a real drive across the country to improve those services and increase access, which is really very relevant to our to our area. Um, next slide, please. So um, what we need really is what you might call a whole pathway approach to stroke. Um, this shows how the stroke care pathway is traditionally divided up. Um, the first thing to remind ourselves of is that prevention covers the whole of someone's life up to the point of having a stroke um, and the community care and life after stroke includes the whole of someone's life after having a stroke. So um, hyperacute care is really those just first few hours and days where we're making every effort to reduce the amount of brain damage that someone suffers after a stroke. Um, acute care is the remainder of the time that acute hospital care is needed. Um, 
and actually provided community services are good enough, um, it's usually only a short period, um, although in BNSSG and a lot of other places, people spend a lot longer in, in an acute hospital than really ought to be necessary. And that's what this subacute period is, is for, really. So that often happens in an acute hospital, but could happen in a community hospital with the right services. Um, could you just show the rest of that slide um, as well? And so, so as you might expect, that most of the comments that we hear from people with direct experience of stroke uh, relate to something other than the first few days of treatment. Um, and one of the things that's actually really felt acutely by people with stroke is, is this dividing up and chunking of the stroke pathway. So um, in order to be able to, uh, sorry, I just want to say something, sorry. Um, it, so, um, in, um, in order to uh, work out how to deliver services, it's, they're often they're often done in chunks. Um, and one of the opportunities that we have locally is really being able to have that that whole pathway um, approach, so that um, uh, and also so that people can have more control over their own recovery. Um, then people tell us, you know, it mustn't be a one-way pathway, so that people can find their access, have access back into specialist help sometimes late sometime later if they need it. Um, next slide. Oh, please. Um, so that's that's all I needed to say really about that. So I'm, I'm going to hand over to to uh, Rob Jones. I don't know if you want to introduce yourself, Rob, if that's all right. Hi, yes. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Phil, um, for that. Um, I'm, my name is Rob Jones. I'm Quality Improvement and Engagement Manager for the uh, Stroke Reconfiguration Programme. I, I'm a neurophysio by background and have worked for, for many years in specialist stroke services um, the last 10 years working in different parts of the stroke pathway within this region. Um, and through that work, I've understood many people's perspectives um, of some of the challenges that people face following a stroke. Um, and obviously, some of those could be significantly improved by the changes to the system uh, that could be made. I've also seen firsthand uh, the massive difference that, that change to a system can make, um, based both, most importantly to patient outcome uh, measures, but also to the quality of the service. And as a result, to the, the morale of staff working in those services. Um, so Phil just uh, on the previous slide uh, shared a few uh, quotes from people um, involved in engagement activity early and, and ongoing through the programme. And I just wanted to, to be clear that those messages are uh, repeated and, and echoed um, through, through the ongoing engagement. Um, from my own experience, these are common thoughts and amongst others, they, they echo the messages from recent large surveys uh, done in the country by the Stroke Association. People with stroke describe services ending abruptly soon after leaving hospital. They report feeling abandoned and needing different types but ongoing support to continue their individual recovery journeys. So uh, in terms of the case for change, there are four main reasons um, for why it is important uh, to reconfigure the stroke services uh, in BNSSG. Firstly, we know that there will be a continued increase in the demand for stroke services. The greatest risk factor for stroke is age, and our local population is ageing. Between 2001 and 2017, the greatest population growth in BNSSG was in the over 85s, and that was followed closely by 65 to 74 year olds. The population of BNSSG is almost a million and, and is growing. And more people are living with long term conditions and therefore present a longer and greater risk of developing a stroke into the future. And uh, some of the, the advancing and, and complex uh, emergency treatment uh, that Phil has, 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 has described just, just a few moments ago um, will reduce the mortality rate uh, following a stroke and, and will therefore lead to more people um, needing uh, long term support following their, their stroke as well, um, as well as reducing uh, the, the initial um, uh, uh, disability um, from that. Nationally, it's estimated that by 2035, there'll be a third more people having uh, and living with the effects of a stroke. So services need to adapt so that specialist stroke care is available to all of those who need it. There is a national issue with recruiting specialist staff into stroke care, particularly consultants and registered nurses. So in BNSSG stroke services, there's currently a 34% consultancy vacancy and varying between 12 and 42% vacancy rate for registered nurses within stroke pathways, within the stroke pathway. 
We know that mortality rates and outcomes are directly affected by the availability of this specialist staffing, so we need to determine a new model of care to ensure greater operational flexibility to deliver these excellent stroke services and to deliver them equally across the region. The provision and quality of service varies considerably across the region, um, depending on where the treatment is delivered and what time of the week. So some services are only available at certain times in certain sites. We need to ensure that as many people as possible will continue to live as independently as possible following a stroke and that the likelihood of achieving this independence is not determined by where the person lives and where they receive their treatment. The individual patient outcomes also vary across the region um, and although um, results in this region are in line with national averages for mortality, not all services are provided in line with national clinical guidance and nor do they meet uh, all of the performance indicators, um, which I'll go on to describe in later slides, um, that we, th those performance indicators that we know improve outcomes for stroke. So, for example, the number of people discharged from a nursing home is higher in BNSSG than the average for the South West. In fact, a review of the stroke services across the South West previously, um, uh, the start of this programme of work, uh, carried out by expert stroke physicians, found that the quality of care for all patients would improve if all patients attended larger centres. So the evidence for centralising highly specialised immediate emergency care both nationally, uh, evidence nationally and regional evidence, is strong. Lastly, we know that there's currently a poor correlation between the spend on stroke and the outcomes achieved uh, in terms of stroke services. By reorganising how stroke care is delivered, focusing on interventions that are known and evidenced to result in the best outcomes, such as some of those uh, emergency, highly specialised immediate treatments that Phil was, was describing earlier, and also the robust follow-up care in the community, we can support the highest number of people to live independently following the stroke uh, and so reduce the long-term uh, care costs as well. So BNSSG can bring greater value to patients by spending NHS money on stroke services differently. Next slide, please. So this diagram demonstrates the varied, inconsistent and inequitable provision of stroke services across the region. Flow through the pathway um, is from top to bottom, as per the box on the left, going from immediate care through uh, acute inpatient care into subacute. Um, sort of rehabilitation phase and then into the uh, long-term um, support in the community. At the three main hospital sites, differences begin with the times that ambulances can be received, what emergency treatment such as thrombectomy and thromb um, thrombolysis is available and um, at what time, and also when follow-on care is available, so what type of follow-on care, sorry, is available um, to maintain the flow through e the acute wards. So um, that follow on care um, uh, is, just, is the early supported discharge service, which is designed to get people home quickly and safely and deliver ongoing care and rehabilitation in a patient's home. And this is only available in two localities currently and is varied in terms of the specifics of each of those two services. Access to very specialist, highly specialist care for the very few patients who need it and um, who have extremely complex needs and um, such as at the brain injury rehab unit or BIRU as it is on the slides there is also inconsistent. The substantial subacute rehabilitation beds are only available in one place in the region at South Bristol Community Hospital in Hengrove and at a very small number in Thornbury and not at all in North Somerset. So towards the bottom of the page, you can see that as of very recently, there's now just one community provider um, providing services, which has given the opportunity of creating uh, equal um, services across the region. But unfortunately, access to the region's excellent life after stroke support from the voluntary care sector, um, although available in some places, is certainly not um, uh, equal across the region and varies depending on location. Next slide, please. So these existing services has, have evolved independently of each other over many years, obviously, um, which has resulted in the significant variation in operational processes and outcomes for people with stroke across the region. 
recent changes from uh, April last year uh, now mean that there's just one community services provider for the whole of the region, which is Serona. Um, so along with that and the merger of Western Area Health Trust with University Hospitals Bristol, meaning that they're just now two acute hospital trusts, these um, have presented the opportunity of aligning and improving services. And that work is already underway. I can say for sure that um, in my previous role um, as a physio, I've seen uh, the action and, and the plans uh, for, for developing work. Uh, and obviously um, through the stroke reconfiguration um, plans uh, as well. Um, but it, uh, it's dependent on the reconfiguration to allow the delivery of excellent services equitably across the region, which will address both the equality and the staffing dilemmas that we described before. Uh, next slide, please. So these tables, um, uh, this, the top table here, present data from the Sentinel Stroke National Audit Programme, which is the main tool for measuring stroke care services across the country. It's reported quarterly and accessible to the public, and it's been running for many years and measures both the processes of care and the structure of stroke services against evidence-based standards like the Royal College of Physicians Stroke Guidance and NICE uh, Stroke Guidance as well. Each trust or team is given an overall rating quarterly through the year, with A being the highest. There's also rating for key indicators, which are strong predictors of outcomes and detailed scores for all elements of care, which, as you can imagine, um, within the programme of work, uh, we study carefully and reflect on. You can see in this top table that scores from October to, de to December in 2018 for Western General, the BRI and Southmead hospitals. Although variability in the scores, you can see a trend of improvement which represents some of the work already done to align and integrate services. Unfortunately, the reports are not available uh, for two periods uh, for Western General Hospital last year, and that was due to lower than expected admissions uh, and uh, patients passing through the stroke services in that hospital. So just a few examples from, of the data from the audit and how it relates to the evidence for improved access to immediate treatment are that there were um, 1,561 acute stroke admissions in 2019-20, and uh, of, of, of whom 139 um, sadly passed away, uh, and that's an 8.9% mortality. Even a 1% improvement in that, uh, which is supported by the evidence for some of the um, Im emergency, immediate um, complex uh, treatment that, that Phil was describing earlier on, um, would have resulted in 15 fewer deaths. In, nine, nine, in 2019 and 20, 221 people um, didn't immediately receive treatment in a specialist stroke unit. An immediate treatment would have enabled 13 more people to be able to be independent just a few months after their stroke. Uh, finally, 38 um, thrombectomies were carried out in 2019-20 at Southmead Hospital, which is just a 2.6% rate of stroke patients. If 10% was achieved, which is um, one of the national um, uh, suggested targets, then 143 more people would have had thrombectomy. And one in six of these, which would be 23 people, would have been discharged from hospital at the same level of independence as prior to their, to their stroke. Uh, can you click uh, on, please, Jeremy? So the larger chart here at the bottom um, is an example from Greater Manchester, um, which is one of the few other areas in the country that have carried out a similar reconfiguration of stroke services. They found that following implementation of the newly reconfigured um, services, which you can see there in the blue box in March 2015, it did include hyperacute centralisation and development of out-of-hospital services as well, that their scores improved and maintained and this adds strong evidence for the reconfiguration of stroke services in this region. The next slide, please. And I think I'd like to pass you on to Alex, please, if you're coming in there. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Hi, everyone. So my name's Alex Ward-Booth. I'm the Head of Insights and Public Engagement at the CCG. Um, I'm going to just talk you through a couple of slides. I'm conscious of time, just a couple of slides, just to tell, talk you through um, the work we've done so far to um, uh, engage with uh, members of the public and clinicians alike uh, to understand and set up the, the kind of next phases of our work. So 
Um, as, as Chris alluded to at the start of the call, um, this has been a long journey for this piece of work, and uh, we started um, engaging with um, uh, with key individuals um, from just 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 over a year ago. Um, and really, in terms of the first first stage of work, it was around um, and throughout that kind of last twelve months, we've engaged with over uh, over two hundred people. Um, and picked up uh, over 500 individual pieces of feedback. So a really robust starting point for which us to, to launch the next stages. But just to talk you through the kind of three main stages of that, of, of that last year's worth of work. Um, first part was for us to start with really um, just understanding, uh, Rob's already talked about some of the other uh, healthcare systems. Um, and, and one of our first pieces of work was to conduct desk research to understand, take key learnings from those other systems, but also looking locally uh, and hosting listening events across uh, Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire um, to really make sure that we were understanding what was important to individuals um, and bringing into those events, not just the voices of those uh, individuals who'd had a stroke, uh, but also crucially their carers, um, members of the voluntary sector, clinicians and other staff to ensure that we're really getting a, a really holistic view of, of uh, what's important to people and, and crucially how we set up our plans from there. Following on from there, we then moved into uh, collaborative working sessions. Um, in many cases, we were working in partnership with speech and language therapists so that we could engage with groups um, in a way where they were uh, properly supported to give us their views. Um, and during those those co-design sessions, we heard from, from 60 people who were really um, telling us about um, what their true experiences were like and helping us to shape what solutions and models might look like based on a, a genuine understanding of, of what it felt like on, on the ground. Um, but in addition to that, we were doing additional feedback surveys uh, during this time just to understand um, a broader views from, from individuals, but also looking at what the impact of uh, COVID-19 had been on those individuals and ensuring that we understand what the impacts of those would be and, and, and how we would need to adjust to that new reality. And we're really now on the, on the next phase of work, which is going into the consultation. It's absolutely critical that um, as we go into, into that piece of work, that we're working collaboratively with individuals to, to make sure that um, everyone is being given uh, the right materials, the right information in the right way at the right time. So we have a reference group of around about 30 service users who will represent the needs of um, individuals with stroke across uh, Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire and, and working with them to ensure that everything around this consultation um, is shaped uh, with lived experience uh, at the heart of it. So Jeremy, if you'll move on, I just want to expand a little bit more on, on some of the things we've learned. This is obviously a lots of information on the chart and I'm not going to attempt to to share all of the detail but just to kind of give a flavour of, of some of the things we've learned from those um, those over 200 people that we've spoken to um, and it's what's really interesting here is that what we hear from individuals is often reflected in the clinical guidance and what we know is, is best practice so um, it's not surprising given the experiences that, that Rob's just identified in terms of the way the system works at the moment that having that clear uh, line of support after leaving hospital is one of the one of the most significant things that just under half of those people that we spoke to um, flagged up that, that that kind of transition period from um, being in hospital and, and into that kind of going back home again is one of the key key things that people know is important themselves as well as that being clinically important. And the other thing we did was looking at other ways we could ask questions to understand what was important to people. So putting them in the shoes of if you had the funds to, to allocate to different aspects of stroke, where would you put those? And what was clearly coming through from that was that as, as we've um, as we've uh, adapted and adjusted to in our approaches, that all four elements from not just when, when you're in the hyperacute and acute care stage, but also prevention beforehand and rehab afterwards are all seen as being equally important to uh, to the public. And, and that reflects our, our mindset and our approach um, as, a, as, a, as a program team. So Jeremy, if you move on. So this is really I appreciate there's lots of information here, but it's just really just to underline that in gathering the feedback and producing those uh, data, the data and the charts that we've just seen, that we're really taking a, a look at all groups across across the area. Now, I suppose there's two key messages from that I would take out from this chart. One is that whilst these are the groups that we've engaged with, obviously I'm, I'm highly conscious that 
on the call today, we, we, we have individuals with a hugely valuable knowledge of the communities that you serve and, and we're keen to work with you and engage with you around other groups that we need to uh, work with and engage with as part of our, our ongoing uh, engagement over the next, uh, through the summer and, and beyond. So really keen for this to be an open dialogue between ourselves around uh, which groups we, we could engage with and, and additional ideas that you'd have. But I suppose the second point here is that whilst a lot of the data that I've shared and the information that I've shared is, is compelling and, and gives us a good idea of what's important, actually we feel that um, what's what's important, crucial to hold against those kind of data points is actually the real stories and, and how it really feels uh, for people. And that's where the role of our lived experience group has been absolutely critical in, in guiding the direction of this of this program. Um, so I'm just going to hand you over to um, Chris Priestman, who's going to talk to you a little bit about what his personal experiences are like. And, and that really kind of brings to life some of the some of the statistics that I've just talked through. So Chris. Yeah, hello. Um, yeah, I'm Chris Priestman. Um, I've been on the Stroke Programme Board for the past two years uh, as one of the patient representatives. I'm also a PPI co-director for the Stroke Health Integration Team, which has become an integral part of the board. Um, Six years ago now, aged 57, weighing a modest 11 stone and a non-smoker, I had a major ischemic stroke on the left side of my brain. I had uh, a one-month stay, first in the BRI and then in South Bristol Community Hospital. And I'm sure that that could have been shortened if there had been a physio regime running seven days a week immediately after my transfer to uh, um, SBCH as opposed to five days. And when I got home, also the seven days a week with the early supportive discharge team. Six years on then, I'm still improving physically on the right hand side of my body and it's important to emphasize this and I'm left with some word finding difficulty hence I'm reading this. I'm keen to say that my experiences of the ambulance and the hospital staff were great. However, when NHS care came to an end after a few weeks and a, a couple of visits also from community care the only rehab available to me was entirely self-funded. This is deeply unfair for most people who've had a stroke and for their carers. I'm sure that this falling off the NHS cliff, as they, they say, this uh, lack of uh, a physio for all those who cannot afford it, contributes to the high rates of depression following stroke. And I also think that there could have been more and better informed communication at each stage of my treatment, both between the staff as I move from one stage to the next and from staff discussing with carers and patients what they could expect as things progress, what is known and what is not known in the years of ongoing care. This is partly a structural change for the board to consider and partly a longer term educational change. But I must say that the decisions taken by this board so far have all been aimed at greatly improving the planned treatment from acute care to life after stroke. And I'm excited to see this big step up come finally to fruition. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Chris. I really, really appreciate you you telling us your story there. Um, I'm really pleased to say that um, Stephen Hill has has just joined our call. We know he's been having some technology problems this morning trying to get onto Teams. But Stephen, can you hear us? Are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Can he? Absolutely fine. So. Great. Um, 
Stephen's going to uh, come in and, and tell you a little bit about um, his experiences in the same way as Chris has just done and, and, and bring to life some of the things that we've just been been talking about. So Stephen, I shall hand over to you. Thanks. Um, sorry it's been a battle to get in. I'm here now. I, <laughs> I haven't heard what else went on. But to talk about me for a minute, um, I had a stroke in 2015. I was still working full time in a university at that point. It, it came out of the blue. It was a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, I'd had a absolutely clear MOT from the GP the day before, in fact, but it was quite a stressful time. And when it happened, the ambulance service and the paramedics were brilliant. They were there within, well, probably a quarter of an hour, actually, and that was out in the country. And I don't remember much after that, taken into A&E, various scans, and eventually woke up in a lot of pain in uh, intensive care. And after 72 hours, was moved across to acute care. I, I'm quite sure they saved my life, but I don't really remember much about it, except the pain and a sense I was on fire. Um, after that, I was in hospital for 10 weeks. I think I was medically fit for discharge well before that. Um, I was with one only solitary exception, extremely well nursed. I can't thank the health care assistants enough just for being there for me and very, very supportive at the time. Um, but uh, the support in terms of rehab was at best describable as patchy. I had a locum physiotherapist who I think was probably not a neurophysiotherapist and um, there wasn't 24-hour service. Uh, at weekends we were really left to our own devices and as it was August then by then two bank holidays on both of which I had no rehab at all and then there would be a case of the ward being mixed up with orthopedic patients who were put in there and seemed to get all the priority for rehab. So twice it happened to me that I sat in a hotel, a hospital room on my own for five days, got no rehab at all. And my discharge was delayed by poor communications between the staff in the hospital and social services. I don't know which end the problem was, but I was effectively a bed blocker and a very frustrated bed blocker by that stage. I did eventually get let out, and that was glorious for five weeks. Early supportive discharge was absolutely brilliant, but after it stopped, and I just heard Chris saying the same thing as I managed to log on eventually, I was left to my own devices, or our family was left to our own devices. Um, since that point, I suppose I probably had six sessions from a community physiotherapist um, which well they were 20 minute sessions and largely concerned with measuring how long it took me to walk six meters which I couldn't really do um, they didn't make a, much difference I can't thank Bristol after stroke enough because I think the support I got from the charitable sector was wonderful and actually in psychological terms it just made a huge difference that somebody was there listening to me um, otherwise anything I've done was my own resources or stuff I had to pay for and again I think there's a huge inequity in all this it's simply a social inequity I think that was very difficult indeed um, so I could have got out I think earlier and I think it would have been better for my future if I had been allowed out earlier um, but really, moving on to the reconfiguration exercise, I did really want to say, and, and people have asked me to say this, a huge thank you to all the professionals who worked so hard on this project on our behalf to get things better for the future. Um, and I simply wanted to say that I feel in this process, it's been reaffirming for me because I've got my identity back as a real person. Uh, able to communicate and I think I've been listened to 
uh, especially recently at the rather frantic stage we've got to now. And I just wanted to say, I think that the way it's going, uh, if we can bring what we desire into effect, we'll achieve that primary objective of making things better for everyone who has a stroke in BNSG, BNSSG. And also, uh, will I hope lead to more parative experience and the more support people get the better their future is so I think it makes economic sense and it certainly didn't make economic sense to keep me in hospital for 10 weeks when latterly it was really rather a pointless exercise and I discovered how much more was possible when I got home so I look forward to a world where we have made a difference and hope that you'll be able to support us in that Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for bearing with the technology. Um, I, so we're just going to hand over to, to Phil, who's now going to talk a little bit more about the uh, the approach and follow up on some of the next steps from there. Uh, thank you. It should be just a, a short piece really here. But I'd I, I, I just like, if I, if I can, just to thank Chris and Stephen again for really illustrating what it's like to have a stroke in BNSSG at the moment. And... Um, and it's also worth pointing out that, that that was in a part of BNSSG where community rehabilitation services are supposed to be better. Um, so, for example, where early supported discharge is available, which isn't everywhere in BNSSG. Um, uh, and also just to, just, just to add that, that Chris and Stephen have both and others have repeatedly reminded us that even after a major stroke, uh, people are very much more than the stroke that they've had. Um, so, so Thank you very much. Um, so really just the last couple of slides for, for, for me is just to, to round it off and say that for, for the last perhaps 18 months, the BNSSG stroke programme has been building on what's been years of thinking about stroke care in BNSSG and hearing what people have to say about local stroke services. Um, and while it's a very complex programme of work, um, it's a major opportunity to really consider the region stroke services as a whole um, and as a response to long-standing inequalities in care um, and in accordance with NHS England's National Stroke Plan. Um, we've also been thinking not just about stroke, but also you know, other conditions that people uh, with stroke uh, very often have. Um, the two maps here are really just an illustration. The top one of where people uh, have had a recent stroke um, so centered around um, Bristol western parts of North Somerset um, and, and really just in, in the uh, the urban areas uh, in the region um, and the lower map which is very small but just an illustration of uh, the index of multiple deprivation so so socioeconomic deprivation um, and the red areas are, are areas where where that that level of deprivation is is highest um, and we've we've been taking these things into account when we've been uh, working out what best to do with stroke services uh, in BNSSG uh, and we really appreciate your your support to continue that work um, but um, so we're, we're in the, the later stages at the moment of developing uh, a proposal for options for changes in stroke services in BNSSG um, because of the evidence, the very strong evidence for reducing death and disability by centralising hyperacute care, um, that these will in, include options for substantial change um, that, that are very likely to require public consultation. Um, if you could just go on to the next slide, please. Yeah. Um, uh, and really, this last slide just shows what we expect to be able to achieve through these changes. Um, and uh, we've discussed all of these already, but I think it's also important to consider what 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 happens if we don't act. Um, and, and one is that the health inequalities that are already very evident in, in our, our system will widen. Um, and it's also projected that social care costs will more than double in the next 10 to 15 years because of the complex disability that, that stroke causes. Um, so we really do need to do something about it and do something about it now. Um, so when we have finalised and agreed these these options uh, for changing stroke care, then we really look forward to talking to you about those uh, and then hopefully the wider public um, in more detail. Thank you. So I'm, I'm handing over to, uh, I think I'm handing back to, to Chris, is that right? Yeah, just, just very briefly. Um, so I, I hope that we've been able to show you um, a compelling case for change in stroke services. Um, in BNSSG and also demonstrated to some extent the complexity um, of delivering stroke care and what needs to change to make it as good as it can be. Um, and so you'll appreciate that proposals 
in the detail are still being developed um, and are still part of active conversation between all of the Healthier Together partners. Um, and so those proposals will progress through um, uh, governance processes which reach a decision on what proposals to put to public consultation um, later in the spring or earlier summer, uh, uh, early summer and um, the, what, what those proposals are, are a statutory decision to be made by the clinical commissioning group in public session. Um, so they're still being worked up. And I, I think the other point I really want to make is that we, we, we really want this to be a genuine consultation, a genuine discussion with the public. Decisions have not been made as yet. Um, we want to hear people's views on the options that are available to us. Um, and so uh, I think when the, for the final part of the presentation, we're just going to run through how we expect that public consultation to proceed um, and then a little bit about the criteria on which the decisions would be made. So I'll hand back to Alex for the consultation process. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. So I'm just got a couple of slides for me just to try and bring to life uh, our approach to the consultation and how we'll move on. And I think in a way what we're really talking about is, is building on um, some of the great work that's already happened in, with guidance from um, service users like Chris and, and like Stephen to, to really make sure that we're going in the, in the right direction on this. So, Jeremy, if you just go to the first slide. First of all, just going to talk about our key principles and priorities for this so the kind of how we'll do it and then on the next slide I'll just talk about kind of what exactly uh, our approach will will involve um so uh, at the first stage it's just worth alluding to the fact that you know as with any consultation we're following a very careful approach to take note of um, our legal duties in terms of consulting and that's really around making sure that um, individuals have a chance to um, uh, discuss and be consulted on, on on ideas that are still at the formative stage and that we take the right care and, and process and enough time to ensure that um, people's voices are heard and that we're able to consider and analyse those in terms of deciding on, on the next steps. But in addition to those legal duties, there are actually some specific con, uh, considerations we need to make for this, this particular consultation because of the nature of um, the, the work that we're looking to do and, and, and those who are most likely to benefit from, from the changes we've discussed. So I'm not going to attempt to go through everything on that list uh, e exhaustively because in some ways they do overlap. Um, so for example, you know, it, it is absolutely crucial that, that our, our consultation is, is fully accessible um, and rec recognising that for um, some of the people that we want to speak with and engage with actually access to information um, either in terms of the technology or as we've kind of um, as we're all aware of but also in terms of the content of what we share is, is absolutely critical and, and reasonable adjustments need to be made to ensure that we're making those uh, making adjustments as, as, as we as we can but in order to do that we need to be very collaborative in that we can't make assumptions about what the way in which information needs to be presented or the way in which we need to share things in addition to that we need to be very very focused on the particular groups who are going to be disproportionately impacted by the consultation and linked to that we need to be very robust and systematic in terms of the way we collect information um, and, and make sure that, that we hear from a, a range of voices across across um, across all of our system uh, to ensure that everyone's views are considered and that we, we can therefore make a decision based on that on that information. So just moving on, I'll talk briefly about how we're going to approach this and and what I didn't want to do today was give you a kind of exhaustive list of all of the methodologies and approaches that we have because clearly in a piece of work like this it, it, that is significant and is really important there are going to be a whole range of tools and approaches that we'll use and actually again going back to a point I made earlier we do want that to be an open dialogue with this group because clearly there may be new ideas innovative thinking in terms of the way we can engage with community groups um, that we can uh, we can learn from from from, from yourselves that will be build and, and adapt and, 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 uh, and, and add value to the approach that we're taking. But just to give a very high level description of it, I suppose our, our mindset here is around we need to have the sort of two levels we need to think about as we engage is both that the broad sample. So where we do a broad reach to a wide range of people, we need to make sure that we have a, a representative sample. So how do we make sure that we work right down to 
local 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 authority output area to really understand that we've heard from a range of views and given every household the same equal chance of being involved um, but then equally balancing that alongside having uh, individual uh, very targeted pieces of work because clearly there are going to be groups who are uh, likely to be those disproportionately impacted where they may be more seldom heard in terms of doing a broad range consultation exercise so where we do workshops and one-to-one -one interviews and, and discussion groups it's really important that we we, we have that balance of methodology to give everyone a fair chance of, of getting involved and then alongside that we also need to think about not just views from people who use the services I mean, use the term patients here but you could call them service users or, or people who've experienced stroke but actually thinking about the broader stakeholders who are so important so you know staff being one really important group within those but but also groups like this one in terms of making sure that we we hear throughout uh, the consultation and make space to to hear views and, and a range of opinions so that we can shape what we do and, and adjust throughout the consultation period as, as a result of that and then uh, Jeremy if you just tap the slide again um, just wanted to talk a, a little bit about how that core piece of work that will take place through through the summer I've, I've broadly talked about July to September here although obviously clearly a lot still to be defined around timings um, is, is around bookending that with at the start really making sure that we work with uh, representative groups to um, to ensure that actually we're developing materials and we're co-designing those so that they're as accessible and, and, and appropriately positioned as they can be and, and we've already started that work going with a kind of Stephen and Chris, uh, along with a, another of their colleagues, Claire, is a part of a kind of core reference group who really hold us to account uh, around the work that we do in setting up this work. But we've got another meeting this week with the service user, representative service user group to really start to talk about how we're going to tackle uh, this piece of work and make sure that we're we're starting with, with that lived experience at the heart of our decision making uh, from the very outset. But also thinking at the end of this process, making sure that we have uh, an independent um, view of our consultation so we're going to be commissioning an independent uh, organisation to do a thematic analysis of, of everything that comes out of our consultation and ensure that we have that objective and independent view of, of everything that we've learned from the consultation. And then I suppose just one more build on there, Jeremy, if you just add, um, tap it one more time. Clearly, we will need to remain um, flexible and, and adaptive as, as things change in terms of our approach to COVID. Um, whilst uh, we always want to be making sure that we're um, uh, clearly safety is, is the primary concern here, we need to have adapted methods for those who may be digitally excluded and, and aren't able to join sessions in the format that we're having today. And how do we make sure that, that their voices are heard and we, we adapt our approaches to, to do that? So we'll continue to, to revise and adjust our approach, but um, we have some, some good solid plans which we've shared with you as part of the pre-reads uh, that will hopefully bring to life the work that we're doing. So I shall hand you hand you back over to Becca, who I think is going to talk about the evaluation criteria. Hi, thanks, Alex. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to be swift through through this because this came out with the papers previously. So um, the evaluation criteria, the uh, joint HOSC has seen before, um, although it was a little while ago now. So we're a little ahead of ourselves, um, given we haven't um, launched the consultation or anything yet. This is to help us guide our decision making on the other side of that um, but we're really conscious of the um, pre-election period uh, that Bristol City is going into and the opportunity uh, to reconvene this this meeting again um, so we are looking for your feedback Jeremy if you would just move that one on um, on our draft evaluation criteria um, to help inform um, final decision making in the in the autumn winter of, of 2021. Um, so like I say, a bit ahead of ourselves um, and I won't go through these because you've had them with the papers, but um, we want to make sure that when we do come to make uh, decisions about the stroke service provision that we're looking at the right thing. So we're really interested to know whether um, these capture all the areas that you would expect us to be thinking about as part of that process. Um, so Jeremy, I think you can skip the next few slides because this is the detail that was included beforehand um, and then just come back to Chris. Yeah, th thanks Becca. Um, yes, all of that detail is, is in papers. So I think that we're done. We've taken up enough of your time. Um, I hope that um, 
uh, it's been helpful for us to share the progress that we've made with the stroke program and very happy to take any questions um, or any comments that you have uh, on our proposals around public consultation and decision making. Perfect. Thank you. Firstly, thank you all for, for the presentation and particularly Stephen Hill and Chris Priestman for your really honest assessment. Um, and I'm sure the panel will, will speak up when they talk, but it's great to hear that you're improving as well. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to open up for questions and comments from councillors. Um, I've clocked a couple in the chat, so what I will do is I'll call you up if you can use the hand function, but I've got Councillor Clough, Councillor Kirk. Hold on, let me swap to my iPad. What are we tasking? Who is up next? Um, then I've got Councillor Roswillis, Councillor Ella, uh, Ella? Eleanor Connolly and Robert Griffin. So I'm just going to write you all down. Perfect. Um, Councillor Clough, do you want to go first? Hang on. Let me just get off mute and off get on, on camera. Um, my question has just been early on about the planning for post-COVID issues, especially as we're seeing blood clots and other um, blood and cardiology based problems with, with it as an infection. So I wonder if Phil, you could tackle that clinical question. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, that's a problem we we have already been dealing with. So those those problems present themselves often quite early after after COVID. So so yes, they're they're all in, incorporated already, uh, and we're seeing those admissions already into hospital. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kirk. Sorry, I, I was um, just about to say, actually, because I've made my comments in the chat function, I won't take too long now. So I, I'm quite happy to make way for other speakers as I've made my points in the chat. But I was I was just really complimenting the attitude to consultation. And um, I, I think it looks very positive in the sense of offering other mean alternative means to online engagement. Um, and so, you know, I, I, it was and to thank you very much for the presentation. It's It's been detailed and extremely extremely helpful for us to see the wider picture and uh, thank you to Chris and Steve enormously as well for, for your input which is um, very helpful to us. Thank you, I'll stop there. Chairman, could I just briefly make a point? Um, yeah, just in terms of the chat function, just to let members or just to reinforce the, the, um, the fact that they, they're not visible on the live stream. So um, for the benefit of members of the public, if points are made, it would be useful to make them um, verbally. Thank you. Councillor Ross Willis, and just to say, uh, Councillor Griffin, I've got you as well on here, and Councillor Riddle as well. Thank you, Chairman. I think I might need stroke services after this morning trying to get on the meeting. I'm now in Western Town Hall and I have pneumatic drills outside the window, so apologies, it's not my fault if anyone can't hear me. I'm just about <laughs> struggling here. Um, I've got two um, comments, please. So can we, I can't see the list, and I know it's not a full list. Can we make sure on the consultation parish and town councils are involved because they have a huge range of voluntary groups that perhaps the CCG or whomever wouldn't have contact with? and also local resident groups in all our areas because they also have a huge email list to be able to get information back. And I would like perhaps if you could get to the farming community because I know they have specific problems, so um, some way or another to get to that area. And I'd just like to speak about the recommendations. On recommendation four, it asks questions. So my view personally and um, from what I've seen before, I would actually think it needs to be shared regularly for any information on briefings, especially if changes are appearing, because we need to be proactive, not reactive. And I personally have always worked that I don't want to come in when uh, something's already been decided or, or put in. I'd rather be proactive and work with it and be more informed. So for us on North Somerset, um, I don't know how others feel, but I would prefer that on recommendation four, that it's an ongoing process 
with chairman, etc., to feed out to um, their panels, please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ros, and sorry to hear the issues you've had. Sorry, gone, Chris. I was just going to say th thanks very much for the, those pointers um, with respect to the consultation. Um, we'll certainly take those on board. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Connolly. Thank you, Councillor Connolly. Um, first, I want to say this is a really impressive piece of work. I, I really I like the way that you have been sort of centering lived experience and actually listening to what people need and want from those services right from the earliest stage rather than waiting until the decision is half made and then kind of backfilling by asking the question. I, I think that's great. Um, the questions, the, the criteria, I think they're really clear. I like the way that you've identified the questions that will tell you whether or not you're meeting those criteria. I was just wondering, was there any weighting attached to the different sections or is that something that will come out of the consultation? I'll give you all the questions and then you can decide. Um, the, there was a clear focus on prevention um, in answer to that question about where, where would you put the funding? So there's clearly a, a really strong um, push for prevention. Is that something that BNS... BNSSG is going to be leading on or is that going to be working with public health? I wasn't quite sure how that, what shape that might take. Um, and then uh, the, I can see that it makes a lot of sense to have that sort of hyper-acute, critical clinical care really focused where there's real expertise and move into the sort of longer term support and, and have those services stretching a lot longer. Um, I guess my question is, what's what's the catch? You know, what, what are the concerns that you have about this restructuring? We saw the Greater Manchester case. Clearly, it's made a big difference. But are there issues that we should be worrying about? Is it going to mean services moving away from local hospitals into that centre? Is it something that we're going to have difficulty selling to people? Um, so just really wondering what your concerns were around that. Okay, so I'll pick up that point, then perhaps go to Becca on the criteria waiting, um, and then either Phil Clatworthy or Phil Simons on on the prevention aspect. Um, so, so in, in terms of, of where the catch is, um, so um, the workforce um, there's a shortage of workforce with the required skills, um, and uh, it's unlikely that we'll conclude um, that we can spread that workforce in the way that it is currently spread um, across all hospitals. Um, and um, you know, the, the clinical evidence from Manchester and the NICE guidance says that um, workforce should be consolidated to maximise the available skills. Um, and that is likely to mean proposals that uh, move the very earliest part of care um, from where they are is currently delivered. Um, so that's what we're um, considering um, and we're considering how best we would do that in our current health service um, and what um, and how to introduce that as a conversation into the consultation to hear people's views on what the possibilities and the options are. So, so yes, I, I think um, ultimately there, there, to, to achieve our ambition, there does need to be change um, the, and we want to discuss with people what that change could be. Um, Becca, did you want to say something about how the criteria might get weighted? 
Yeah, absolutely, um, Chris. So we we are still working about this. It's not an exact science, um, and um, there are pros and cons of putting firm scores and adding up numbers as a result of evaluating um, these sorts of proposals. Um, so we we're going to have a, a group look at it properly, um, and your feedback is an important part of that. Um, what we will have is a number of layers of, of scrutiny of our conclusions so even if we don't end up kind of doing something um firmly numerical that we we look at it will be judgments of uh, positives and negatives against the different sections and it will be the culmination of all of that that we need to take through our straight program board which as you've heard has got people with lived experience and expert clinicians and finance people and others um and representation from across our our health and care system on it um, and then we will use our governance structure right through to chief exec level and our healthier together um, executive group and partnership board. Um, so there'll be a, a very rigorous process around the decision making itself. Um, and we're just in the process of designing kind of exactly what that looks like. Thanks, Becca. And I wonder if Phil Simon's your best um, Phil's our GP primary care clinical lead for the programme, I think on the call. I am. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, yes, um, I, I'm a, a local GP and the CCG clinical lead um, for stroke. Um, I, I'm glad that uh, prevention was brought up. It's obviously a very, very important part uh, of all this week uh, or this work. Um, uh, it, the exact nature of it, we're still working with various partners about how this will be determined. Um, but we, but it is on the agenda with the CCG working with primary care and with public health um, and together with the stroke hit and, and with patients and other partners. Um, it'll build upon the current work that's already going on, the good work going on in primary care with lifestyle and, pre and preventing and better control of blood pressure and heart rhythm disturbances, for example. Um, one of the aims will be working with the stroke hit and with public health with better public education for the lifestyle measures and also for people to be more aware of their blood pressure, for example, and other health indicators. Um, and going forward, it is part of the NH NHS England's ambition with improving the cardiovascular health of the nation. And there are various programmes which are being uh, made, as we, uh, made as we speak that will be implemented with this um, uh, and will help drive this forward. So I hope that gives a flavour that we are well aware of this of prevention as being um, a heart of this, I guess, um, and uh, are working towards providing providing this to a better scale. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Phil, you've put your hand up. Did you want to respond to anything that anybody said? You're on mute. Sorry, I am Phil. Try, sorry. I am Phil. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I had two, two Phil. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Were you mean, sorry, were you ahead. meaning me? I was meaning you, yeah. Um, I, I was just going to add a little bit of context in relation to the status quo for um, for, for North Somerset in particular, um, in that actually a, a, the, at that earliest part of care for people out of hours um, and at weekends who are, who are brought to hospital by ambulance, um, that all there, there are already a significant number of people who come to Southmead Hospital. So if it were to be sited at Southmead Hospital, for instance, actually the, the programme provides the opportunity to to, to help people get home uh, and closer to home more quickly. Um, so so yeah, while there would potentially be uh, a a move uh, of some some people to to one centre, um, actually I think overall it's more about e equaling things out. So some would move, but actually some people would get home a lot earlier because um, we've got the opportunity to reduce the amount of time people spend in hospital. Excellent, thank you, uh, Councillor Griffin. Uh, thank you. Um, I do appreciate the the amount of work that's gone into this reconfiguration. The only thing I came up with was um, the magic hour at the beginning. Now, with the lots of situations and overloads at hospitals, can we learn something from the highlands and islands where all their paramedics are e equipped with clot-busting injections 
to use them immediately before hospitalisation. Bill Clatworthy, do you want to comment on that? Yes, if that's okay. I think the, here there's a bit of a difference between um, heart attacks and strokes um, because um, in a heart attack you, you can use a heart trace and ECG to determine who needs treatment. With uh, with stroke, you need to have a, a brain scan to make sure that it hasn't been a hemorrhagic stroke or bleed um, before you know it's safe to give those treatments, otherwise they'll make things worse. So. Um, if you're to try and do things in ambulances, you need really a very comprehensive service with a CT scanner in an ambulance, which is enormously expensive. So I mean, that can be considered, but it is quite different because you do need to have that initial CT scan um, to make sure that it's safe to give those treatments. OK, thank you. Councillor Riddle and then we've got Councillor Cherry. Thank you very much and congratulations on, on all the work you're, you're doing and uh, and also on setting up the consultation. Um, my question is around uh, residents with learning difficulties. Uh, we know that um, people with learning difficulties have, have a, a poorer health, both physically and mentally. And I was wondering if that was the case with strokes. Are they more at risk uh, of having a stroke? And and how would you go around tailoring the, the service uh, around people with uh, with learning difficulties. Thank you. Well, I'm coming back to you again. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I think that's something that when we're moving through the the, the reconfiguration, we really need to think very carefully about because they are at more risk. Um, and we do sometimes see people in hospital who have learning difficulties, who've had a stroke, who haven't received the care that they ought to have done. So um, it, it's something that is is still being worked out in in terms of particularly the, the sort of community base, but also the awareness of stroke and making sure that if somebody has a stroke, it's recognised early and they get to the right place for care as soon as they possibly can. So I'm, I'm really grateful for you raising that because it's a really important part. Thank you. Robert Jones, did you want to jump in on that? Yes, thank you. Just very quickly, just to, to, to say yes, absolutely. We, we are very well aware of, of those extra needs for people with learning disabilities. Um, we've already made uh, strong links with um, leads uh, in community and the acute provider um, learning disability teams who, who are actually trying to put us in touch with individuals who can give us comment on uh, thoughts and plans and proposals so far. Uh, and again, just, just to mention from my own experience, I'm, I'm sort of well aware and, and have had experience myself in working with, with people with those learning disabilities and it's very much at the sort of planning discharge end uh, that, that's essential that, that we get the kind of the discharge right and and again we taking that into account in the planning of those out of hospital services thank you yeah thank you for that excellent uh council cherry thank you very much um that was an excellent explanation all, all around by different um departments um I'm conscious that um, as a representative of a ward with perhaps the oldest residents in North Somerset, that um, there's a real issue about um, the consultation being um, effective and not just online, because I know some another councillor has mentioned this, because um, many, many people feel excluded and um, want to make their views known about access. The other thing that I'm very conscious about is that because the um, inequality maps, which you kindly shared, show that we've got um, deep inequality in areas of Western and within Bristol, it's vital that we get across to the, the public that we're not sacrificing certain areas because access for treatment earlier on makes a very big difference to outcomes doesn't it so i suspect that people will feel in north somerset that they want to know that um because they're so much further from if 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 it becomes concentrated in south mead the actual treatment that they are going to get um extra help either by more expensive training for the paramedics and those scans that people mentioned but there's got to be a way to ensure that people from western or across north somerset who are traveling for treatment get early treatment if possible on the way to the hospital anyway i, I would just like to know if that's possible at all 
And also, I also want to know that we will be investing enough in prevention to ensure that that, because that's clearly a very good way of um, uh, helping these figures. Thank you. So, so thank, thank you for that. I, I, I think you know, it is one of the guiding principles, if you like, that, that the whole programme is working on, that we maximise the access to the best treatment for everybody, for the entire population. Um, and we uh, are obviously aware of um, uh, location being really important for people. Um, mm -hmm. and 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 traveling times and ability to travel which might be um, affected by deprivation so all of those are really important parts of consideration of uh, our conclusions and are in our decision making criteria um, so uh, definitely really important um, and uh, prevention um, is a uh, work stream of its own um, within within the program um, so that we've got proper and full focus on um, on all of that you know ev everyone would agree that preventing a stroke is better than treating it once it's been had um, uh, and uh, there's there's pretty good knowledge um, of the things that can be done uh, as Phil said earlier on throughout the lifetime before the stroke happens um, to try and reduce those risks but we've, we've got a, a work stream that's focused on that um, that will come forward with um, recommendations. Excellent thank you. Is there anybody else to speak? I can't see any more raised hands. No. Silence. That, that must be no. Um, excellent. So uh, I'm aware, obviously, in the report, there are, if I was to summarise it, a couple of recommendations and in effect that support for the consultation kind of framework, um, the evaluation framework. And then there's kind of a last one about how do you engage with uh, JHOSC um, as we go forwards. So what on the last point about how you engage with JHOSC, what I was going to suggest and, and chairs of other um, HOSPs, let me know if this isn't fitting with you, but we could see if the BSN, BSNSG, we need to change that, the, the CCG, um, if you'd like to do a, a workshop with us during the consultation phase, so we can feed back into there. And then I suppose the second half is once that consultation has ended, obviously you'll be assessing that, coming up with recommendations, then come back to JHOSC for that kind of the formal process. Anyone thinks that's a terrible idea, now is the time to shout at me really. No one shouting. That's, that's a positive for a posit politician, isn't it? Um, so, so I think we'll take that then. If you're content with doing a workshop with Jay Hosk during that consultation, so this is what June to September ish, um, and then come, yeah, perfect, and then come back formally to Jay Hosk once you've had your opportunity to evaluate. Yep, that sounds that sounds ideal. Very, very happy to set that up and work on it. Okay, perfect. So on that basis, then we've got recommendations in the report, um, which are that we support the consultation framework, support the evaluation outcomes, and we'll engage, as I just said, then. Um, can someone propose and second that? Well, two people, sorry. By a show of hands will be fine. I've caught you, Ruth Jacob, so, and someone's here, and Councillor Clough, excellent. So is anybody gonna abstain on that? No. Anybody against that? In that case, that's, that's what we'll take the recommendation to be. Perfect. Um, so thank you uh, for all the speakers, um, really helpful, re really great content you covered there. I am mindful of time, but that was a really important thing. So the next item on the agenda is around Bristol and South Gloucestershire community surge testing. Uh, Christina or Sarah, I've got you down for, for this. I'm not sure which one of you will be doing that. Hi, it's a double act. Double act, I'm, that's fine. I'm always yeah, double act. So Christina here, so I'll start and then um, uh, uh, Sarah will uh, come in to say a bit more about what's been happening in South Gloucestershire in particular. So um, I think you've all seen the brief covering report for noting. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> I just want to put new variants in a little bit of context for you. Um, viruses, it's in the nature of viruses to change and mutate. That's what they do. And they do it all the time. Um, thousands and thousands of changes and mutations. Um, some of those help the virus adapt and survive, 
and some of them help the virus adapt and survive in ways which are not helpful um, to us as human hosts. So the changes that we are concerned about are those changes which are problematic. And uh, when that happens, um, these are observed. And when they're observed in a consistent way, that strain is called a variant of concern. So you'll start to see this word VOC appear, V-O-C, VOC. Um, you may also start to see um, variant under investigation, V-U-I. That's when something's been observed, but it hasn't been given a particular new name or a, or a type or a class of its own. Um, so I would say that uh, in the UK, Public Health England and our um, scientific community are among the best in the world at this. Um, we have a surveillance system, so a proportion of all the positive cases are uh, selected um, and they are um, genomically sequenced to look um, uh, in a, to, to try and find these changes and to, and to stay ahead. Um, so the first thing to note is that the reason that we are observing these changes and these strains and these new vox or variants of concern is because the scientific community is actively looking for them. Our UK scientific community, but also working with the international global public health scientific community. And it is quite a remarkable endeavor. Um, just remind everybody that um, when COVID-19 was, was first identified, it was first observed um, in the September, October of um, 2018, and by February 2019, it had been um, genomically sequenced. And by February 2019, that uh, sequencing had enabled work to begin on uh, treatments and the vaccine. And it's why within a year or uh, within a year of the virus arriving in the UK, that we have the rollout of the vaccine programme and we have better treatments. So part of this is about we have to we have to see this, we have to understand it in order to enable our scientific community to stay ahead and, and they have done so very successfully on our behalf. So there are currently nine VOX or variants of concern that have been identified and that are listed as existing in the United Kingdom. The one which is the most dominant is the one which began in the east um, of England. And they, they all have quite complicated names, um, partly a date and then a number. Um, so um, the, the variant which began in the, in the east of England, which is VOC 2020 1201. Um, and it's B1.1.7 is its um, sort of genomic family name. And that is now dominant in the UK. And it's become dominant because its adaptability meant that it was more transmissible. So the, the wave that we've been just been through has been, for the most part, been driven by that particular variant. Um, uh, there's work I'm going to see whether to, to ascertain whether that variant is and of itself more harmful. It's certainly caused more harm because it's more transmissible. So the more, transmi more transmissible a virus is, the greater harm, obviously, it does. Now, what um, the, the surge testing, the first lot of surge testing that we undertook in Bristol and South Gloucestershire was around um, an observation which had been made around that variant with an additional change or mutation, which is called E484K. And the E484K change or mutation has been observed on a number of strains. And it's of particular concern because there is some question about whether it may compromise the human immune response and therefore have um, some impact 
um, on vaccine efficacy. That is not proven, um, but it is a concern and it is why this particular uh, change is being um, closely observed. So what was observed was we had this dominant strain, which was the East of England strain, with this additional change, E484K change. Now, a very small number of those cases, the East of England um, strain, the initial one, has uh, there's over 120,000 cases, positive cases in the UK. For this uh, strain with this change, there are currently, as of today, 35 cases in the whole of the United Kingdom. What was observed and why we had the surge testing was because 11 of those, 11 cases had been observed in the sort of greater Bristol, um, South Gloucestershire area. And at that time, there were just over 20 cases in the UK, around 11 of which were local to us. Now, the first thing that happens is that there is very forensic public health um, response to to look at that uh, cluster of, of cases and that involved something called enhanced contact tracing and additional testing and through that process the 11 cases um, locally increased to 22 cases locally through that process. These were all historic cases they're not live cases, they're cases which happened some time ago. The test and trace and the isolation had all been completed. So we're not talking about a live outbreak. We're talking here about a historic situation that we're trying to understand more about. Um, we were then advised, because there was particular concern about this uh, strain nationally, uh, to undertake the surge testing. Surge testing was taking place or is taking place all around the country related to different variants. So we were advised to undertake the surge testing, which we duly did over the two weeks. Uh, we undertook uh, 40,000 uh, asymptomatic tests ac ac across all of the postcodes across um, Bristol and South Gloucestershire. The good news was that a very low proportion of those were actually positive. So 1% of the asymptomatic tests were positive compared to around 3% of our symptomatic tests were positive. So that was reassuring in that what it indicated was we weren't sitting on a very large reservoir of infection that, that we couldn't see. It's taken some time to get the genomic sequencing back uh, we requested at the same time that all of the positive tests that we had during the two week pe period were genomically sequenced. However, due to capacity on the laboratory, that's coming back quite slowly. Uh, today, I can tell you that two cases have been, further cases have been identified with the strain through the genomic sequencing. That takes our local total to 24 known cases out of a, t uh, out of a total in the country of, of 35. Um, there's no further um, action um, on this cluster of cases at the moment because they are historical, they have been observed, the public health action was taken to prevent the onwards, uh, onward um, infection, um, but we will continue obviously to monitor the situation. So that situation for now is um, subject to sort of, uh, we're still watching it, but there's no further action on that particular cluster of cases. But I will now hand to Sarah, who will um, talk you through what's been happening um, in South Gloucestershire. Thanks, Christina. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Blackmore, Director of Public Health in South Gloss. And apologies now to South Gloss councillors on the call who've heard me talk about variants quite a bit lately. Um, <clears throat> it's like waiting for a bus in South Gloucestershire to come along at once. So um, I'm sure you've seen coverage in the media um, in relation to um, the identification of the P1 variant of concern in South Gloucestershire. 
So the P1 variant of concern is the variant that was first identified in Manaus in Brazil. Um, just mirroring, I guess, uh, what Christina has described, um, we've taken a robust and rapid response to that and mirrored the approach we took with surge testing round one. So three key strategic aims really are around improving uh, testing, increasing the amount of testing that's available for asymptomatic uh, people in a defined geography. And this time for the P1 variant, it was a smaller geography, but it was still inviting 30,000 people to come forward for testing if they were asymptomatic. And actually of those during a period of two weeks, 50% have come forward for testing, which is fantastic and a real um, tribute to our, our residents and, and our local trusted voices and counsellors who've helped us make that happen. So uh, that was one key approach and then the two other aspects of our strategic approach are around enhanced surveillance and contact tracing which again um, mirrored our first approach so ensuring that we were quickly getting on top of um, the stories, understanding um, where the close contacts were and acting on that and putting in place the appropriate public health action. And then the third uh, approach within the strategic uh, plan is around increasing the amount of whole genome sequencing. So clearly, again, that's what Christina has described as ensuring that we then, if any cases are identified as positive, are followed up with sequencing and we then identify if there are any other variants of concern. So in terms of that action, I guess what's really key to highlight is that no matter what the variant, the public health action is the same and it's in place and it's in place quickly. So that's what's happened this time. Um, and again, just picking up on uh, Christina's point that viruses change all of the time. And this is something that we are adjusting to. So we're adjusting to um, variants um, and we're adjusting to actually testing becoming the norm, although clearly we don't want surge testing to become the norm, but actually one of the key aims for the roadmap and getting us moving us forward along the roadmap nationally is regular testing. So I think that's probably all I was going to cover. The final point for me really is just to say in terms of regional approaches to this, we've now got a new variants group in place which meets on a weekly basis and plays close attention to the data that's that's circulating in terms of the science and in terms of what we're learning all the time in relation to variants of the virus. So I think that's probably it from us. I'm really happy to pause there for any questions. Thank you both. I just wanted to comment on how phenomenal kind of all of that search testing was and, and the work that you and your public health teams have done. I um, also wanted to apologise, Sarah, I realise I called you Sarah, um, as someone whose name gets always pronounced wrong. Sorry, I thought I would apologise all the time. <laughs> yeah, same here. Um, anybody got any questions at all? If so, raise your hand. Nothing popped up here. So on that basis, thank you both. Um, so we'll move to the final item on the agenda, which is integrated care systems. Uh, quite likely to sneak over uh, quarter past one, but I would try and make sure we are done by half past. Um, Sebastian or David, uh, one of you are leading on this one. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sebastian Habibi, and I'm a programme director within the Healthier Together Partnership. So I work with many of the people that you heard from speaking today uh, on the earlier items regarding stroke uh, and testing. Um, Thank you for inviting me. I'm here to talk about uh, integrated care system development or the next phase of it here in Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire. And I'm joined by a colleague, David Moss, who will pick up towards the end of uh, the session to talk about uh, the work we're doing uh, on that at a place level across our area, building on the on the localities that have been been operating uh, across our area since 2017. Um, we are at um, an early stage of, of this next phase of our journey. So I'm going to be talking about what it's about, some of the issues that are involved um, and the process uh, through which we'll develop proposals and, and agreements uh, later on this year. Um, so, 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 so what is it? What is integrated care system development all, all about? Well, um, 
integrated care is what it says. It's integrated health and care, you know, health and care that, that's joined up, that's um, preventative, that's proactive, that's person centred. And it's been developed all around the world because, of course, all around the world, health and care systems face uh, you know, similar challenges you know, with ageing populations, um, comorbidities as people live increasingly for longer with long term conditions, uh, opportunities in new technologies, including drugs. Uh, and of course, the uh, the global pandemic. Uh, so integrated care systems are, are, are not new in England and they're not new around the world. They do take many different forms around the world. So some of them are public, some of them are private, some of them are run by single organisations and some of them are run by partnerships. So they're different all around the world, um, but they share much in common, uh, particularly in terms of what they're trying to achieve um, and the kind of key ingredients for success in achieving their aims. I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. In England, integrated care systems involve the local NHS working in partnership with local government and with other partners. Uh, so in our case, general practice, uh, the community health service provider, Serona, uh, the ambulance trust, for example, as well as the NHS hospitals that provide physical health and mental health and the CCG and the three councils. Um, so they're partnerships. They take collective responsibility for meeting the needs of their populations, for delivering services to meet the needs of those populations, for managing resources, all for the purposes of improving outcomes. The definition of what do we mean by improving outcomes varies around a theme. So the, the, the latest articulation of that nationally is a quadruple aim. Um, I feel it resonates with the aims of the partners here in, in Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire. The, the four points on it are about improving health and well-being, reducing inequalities, improving value for money and promoting social and economic development. So in our area, we've been working as a healthier together partnership since 2016. And we established our partnership to improve health and well-being for our residents. And there's a summary of a vision statement that was agreed by our partnership board that's set out in your cover paper. As of December 2020, um, so just this winter, we were recognised nationally um, and designated as a maturing integrated care system, um, which was welcome recognition of um, the progress that we've made in partnership working and the things we've achieved together. Um, you know, so some of that structural you know, we used to have three CCGs and now we've got one. Uh, we merged the, the, the Hospital Trust at Western with the University Hospital Bristol to create University Hospital Bristol and Western Foundation Trusts. We went from a more fragmented uh, system of providing community services to a more integrated one with Serona taking a contract to provide services across the whole of our area from April last year. So some of it's structural. Some of it's about the way services are provided. So we've got integration and frailty care now, which we didn't have. We've got wraparound health support 24 seven for our care homes, which has been critical in the last year. We've got increased access to rehabilitation for people discharged from hospital. So reducing some of those blocking and delay issues that uh, Chris and Stephen were talking about in relation to stroke, for example. Um, We've got new technology enabling access in different ways, online and telephone for GP services and for consultant services. We've got ability to book direct when you call NHS 111. And of course, we've had all sorts of collaboration in our continuing response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, whether that's sharing PPE when there was a shortage um, and making sure it gets to where it's needed, no matter who it's earmarked for officially and collaboration in the rollout of our mass, vac mass vaccinations uh, uh, program across our area. So we've achieved a lot together in designation formally, getting the badge, so to speak, with some welcome recognition of the progress that we've made in December. So this is now the next phase of our journey. And I wanted to highlight two, two things before sort of handing over to David to talk about a more local dimension. I wanted to highlight two things um, that characterize what's involved in the next phase of our journey, having been designated, having got the badge and having been recognised for the progress that we've made up to December 2020. Um, the two things I wanted to highlight is, 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 is continuing to develop our partnership, if you like, the kind of evolution of the things we've been doing together. And secondly, the more revolutionary change that the government nationally 
has signalled with its intention to bring legislation to Parliament in the next few months. Uh, that would create a sort of new future state for integrated care systems that, that we'd all have to implement uh, if that legislation is passed by April 22. Um, so the evolutionary bit first. So whether or not there was going to be legislation, our, our partners have, have resolved to continue to, to improve partnership working for the benefit of our residents. Um, and some things that are highlighted on page three and four of your paper that our partnership has committed to, to develop uh, include the development of an outcomes framework, first of all. So, you know, we've set a high level vision, we've set high level strategic goals. An outcomes framework would be about how we measure progress against those goals over the long term, but also very deliberately from the short to the long term. How we involve people in measuring how we're doing and how we account to people for what we're doing. And Sarah Blackmore, who you heard from a little earlier, is uh, one of our uh, senior responsible officers leading, leading that work within the partnership. Uh, secondly, development of place. David will say more about that. Thirdly, development of the strategic relationship between health and wellbeing boards and, and all things we do, including what we do at place. Fourthly, the continued development of joint commissioning Fifth, the continued progress on data sharing and interoperability in our digital infrastructure. Sixth, the continued collaboration in workforce development. Seventh, sharing of estates and other resources. Eighth, joint approaches to performance and quality improvement. And ninth, continued collaboration in communications and public engagement. And again, you saw some examples of what we're doing in relation to stroke earlier in your agenda. Um, so much to be done that's evolutionary. But secondly and importantly, we also expect to have to prepare for new legislation that, that the government's announced, uh, the LIT will introduce, and of course that the government's got a significant majority and therefore ability to pass. The government's saying that it'll introduce that legislation, it expects it to be passed and to come into force from next April. And they published a white paper in February setting out some of the intentions uh, that we now need to prepare for locally. Um, so they said in this white paper, um, that integrated care systems will, will, will exist in statutes and they will consist of two parts, a statutory body and a health and care partnership. The health and care partnership, I hope, will enable us to, to sort of transition from what we have now as a partnership board into the future state relatively unscathed. The statutory body is a more revolutionary change. It looks like the CCG will be replaced with a new with a new statutory body that will have new new structure new governance and that will have a board that is in part um, comprised of members of the local health and care partnership so the intention i as I understand it is for nhs bodies and local government partners to have a seat on the board of this new statutory body that as i say will replace ccgs throughout england that body will be responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the, uh, the NHS and for resource allocation and planning, operational planning within the NHS, whereas the wider partnership will bring together local government wider partners, including the voluntary sector, to address health, social care and public health needs of the area in a more strategic sense. In terms of process, we're in an engagement phase at the moment. Um, so we're running a series of, of workshops with each of the partners that are involved with Healthier Together. Uh, but we're about halfway through that. Um, so we've had workshops, for example, with North Somerset Council and with South Gloucestershire Council. And we have one with Bristol City Council that's planned uh, for the last week of March, just before Easter. Um, we'll then go into more of a content development phase as we head through the spring. You know, looking to develop draft proposals for agreement between the partnership. The process will be overseen by our partnership board and our executive group. And in terms of governance, we go through the, the, the through the summer period and we end up uh, looking to sign off uh, agreements on how we're going to take this work forward with all of our partners as sovereign bodies and as a collective partnership by, by September. So that's an overview of integrated care system development as is set out in your paper. I've ended up just focusing on, on some key points on the process. I wanted to now hand over to my colleague David Moss to talk about the development of place-based partnerships within that process. 
Thank you, Seb, and, and Chair, I'll be as, as quick as I can whilst covering the content. Um, so, so my name is David Moss, I'm the Programme Director uh, to support uh, the providers in our system, in, including local authority, voluntary sector, GPs, hospital trusts, um, the, the full plethora uh, to, to want to work together at place and, and what, what that could mean. Um, within what Seb has described in our in our ICS system that uh, exists now and is is beginning to be iterated from uh, for the future, so so there's there's been a dis approach to this that's been signed off by the Healthier Together Partnership Board, um, and that's very much uh, let, let's see what's out there, let's see how this could be done um, to deliver our aspirations that Seb set out of 24/7 wraparound preventative care. Um, at a place level um, and, and some of that emergent um, uh, legislation has has only um, validated what we've been doing for some time in many ways uh, with the six localities that you see in your paper um, working as a, a collaborative of the providers in, in building relationships and in, in understanding each other's way of working and digital and, and the people they serve and, and how that might work together or be different um, which puts us in a really nice place to think that we'll more formally develop those integrated uh, care partnerships to to serve um, the people at a place level uh, where it doesn't make sense or, or makes more sense would be a better way of saying that than, than doing something at a, a system level and some of those straight discussions about preventative care in the future might be by an emergent um, integrated care partnership that considers the whole person and not just their stroke element of their pathway because we're people at the end of the day and we, we don't live by um, or, or only have one condition in so many instances and the idea of all of this is that we wrap care around uh, the individual with, with what is likely to be uh, more emergent sort of more more instances of complex care where they're using more than one service as we get older and, and have more going on in our lives. Um, so, so all of that considered, uh, there's uh, there's been a, a, a an oversight group that's chaired uh, by Mike Jackson, who's the um, CEO of Bristol City Council, but but has representatives of of all of the providers, including the voluntary sector and local authorities, um, who've who've been working with me to to be looking at what else has been going on nationally and internationally, uh, and and to take the best in class really to say. We know who we are and what we've got going on, but what, what can we take from other systems and, and make sense for us? Um, because what's really clear is there isn't a blueprint, say this is how you do integration. Um, let's lift and shift it to our system. Um, and it's been really helpful. We've 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 uh, ignited some really helpful conversations. There's some great work going on in Alaska and America. Um, there's some really interesting stuff coming out of um, Israel, uh, as well as Christchurch in New Zealand, which are the sort of pieces that we're 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 stealing from. Um, but also within the UK, so we we have a, a regular meeting with Manchester now, who uh, have a out of hospital provider where they uh, have integrated in a way that that. Um, joins up services um, under the umbrella of a hospital trust in that in that area. Not to say that's what we're proposing. Um, and so we've been going through this journey. Um, and what's really nice about it is uh, we're able to really make it tangible and, and less uh, theoretical by uh, focusing on an opportunity. And, and that opportunity is community mental health services um, where we, we want to uh, use integrated care partnerships uh, to provide that service from April 22. Um, taking of all of the learning that uh, I've described uh, and, and the, the history and legacy of, of the six localities and, and how they've been working together um, and in an integrated way come up with a, a service proposal in, in response to a specification that really makes sense to the people that that service is um, providing services for. So um, I think it's all very exciting and it sits very nicely under the ICS um, work that Seb's describing there and uh, I'll pause there in, in case there are questions. Right, the perfect moment, Councillor Kirk. Um, thank you very much indeed for, for that presentation. I think there's still an awful lot of uncertainties with the ICS and I know a lot of our residents are still very confused because it's it's largely theoretical still and, and we have yet to see how it shapes up in practice. Um, I think some of the biggest uncertainties 
important is that that has that were mentioned in the report have been issues such as the funding of social care um, and the role of local authorities and where democratic accountability will sit. And we've also got the huge issue of whether the government decide to end competitive procurement. So I feel that there's still a huge, some really major uncertainties there. And in the report, um, a lot of re responders had said that they wanted to have further conversations with government or NHS England prior to the legislation being enacted. And I'm, my question to you is, are those off opportunities being offered by national health service leaders or by the government to continue that engagement before the legislation comes in? Thank you. Yes, to some extent, they are offering those off opportunities. Yeah, I mean, we haven't seen the, the draft bill yet, and, and maybe we won't see it before it's introduced into Parliament. But we, but we are being linked to people in um, NHS England who, on behalf of the Department of Health and Social Care, are being identified to lead on the development of guidance. We haven't had seen any of the draft guidance yet, but the process is shaping up to enable all of the systems in the southwest, if you like, uh, link in to teams within NHS England nationally, who are developing guidance on key, key issues such as governance, uh, the new financial framework uh, for integrated care systems, uh, workforce development and so on. It's still early days. But it's encouraging signs so far, Councillor, I guess is how I'd summarise it. Sure. I, I wonder if I could ask, because there's still a lot of uncertainty, whether we could have a lot more clarity going forward in the next year up until April at 22. Um, because I, I, like somebody said earlier, I wouldn't like to think this is all done and dusted and imposed without us ha having some, you know, pretty detailed progress reports. Um, so I'd very much like to ask that we, we get some regular updates in the coming year. I'm sure they'll be scheduled anyway, but I, that is a formal request, please, that we, we are able to follow that through as councillors as those negotiations take place. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. We'll work out where that can be done. Jay Hoskell actually will do it for your own because we've, we've had these conversations before on North Somerset about this, and we'll work out which way it works. But yeah, that, that's absolutely fine. Um, Councillor Ross Willis, and then I've got Councillor Cherry after. Thank you, Chairman. So I ha also have concerns um, and questions without answers about funding and how it's shared. And uh, those details do need to be sorted, as we hear. But also, if this is going to be in place as a shadow from uh, April, which is what I've read in the papers, unless I've misread it, um, how can that be in shadow with any funding issues not sorted out? Um, I'm not sure whether that will make it better or worse. Um, uh, and also under social care funding. So if, if it's a shared pot or if the CCG were calling, because I can't say Buzz Nuggets too much, if the CCG hold them, uh, all the funds, how does that work for each local authority with their contracts with their own care homes, you know, our own contracts we have? Because we already know there's a variant between, um, you know, Bristol funding and North Somerset funding for care homes. And I'm, I have concerns, you know, a, about where that's going and I can't see any detail on it and perhaps it's because it's not there but as um, the previous councillor has just said you know there are a lot of questions still not in place and answered if this is going to be a shadow in April 21 where we are now that is awfully soon to be going into something blind and I'm not happy about going in blind Thank you, Kat. So in terms of shadow running, um, David may want to say something about the local partnerships. The, um, the integrated care system, of course, already operates. Um, and the, uh, the, the idea of shadow running is that by September, the, uh, the, the, the board of the new statutory body will be operating in, 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 in shadow. As far as the financial regime is concerned, um, we're not expecting any changes um, in the financial year 21-22. There are 
considerable further details to be outlined, as the councillor has said. However, at a high level, our understanding of the government's intention nationally is that local government would continue to hold statutory responsibility for social care and the funding for social care as now. And the new ICS statutory body would hold responsibility for the NHS budget and would allocate that budget through the new governance structure and that that budget will be expanded to include some of the budgets currently held by NHS England, notably the budget for primary care locally and some specialised services. Yeah, and just just to build on that, the notion of shadow uh, within April uh, next month is uh, specifically in relation to the integrated care partnerships of the providers at a place level and, and that's mostly about um, those providers understanding uh, some agreement on footprints. Uh, we have six at the moment. Let's just ensure we want to work with six in the future and and then running a shadow process to understand the population health for, for those footprints and how that might be considered in the light of the community mental health specifically in the first instance. So so no moving of budgets in that instance. It's um, about specifics of community mental health. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cherry. Thank you very much. Um, we have actually scrutinised this in North Somerset and one of our concerns has been about actual scrutiny and when I hear there are gaps and um, things are going to be put in place and um, I know that there is some detail but it still seems that there are significant holes and what I think all these councillors are saying is that we need more information going forward so that we can make sure that we're doing what is right for North Somerset. At the moment, there's, there's, we just keep being told it's going to be, things are going to change and there's going to be lots of changes and it's all very well thought out. But because there's so little de detail and there's been so much change within North Somerset and the very nature of the partnerships are structures which are hard to scrutinise. So they may be charitable structures or or different structures they're not they're not what we are used to so we do need far more information and um, it's not people are being difficult against change they're not they just want to be kept informed so that we can hold the government to account on this because it is deeply political thank you okay. did either of you, do you want to respond to that yeah, I think I really recognise your points and um, uh, I, yeah, very much for the integrated care partnerships um, uh, an engagement and, and communication requirement moving forward. Um, we've very much been in a discovery phase and, and sharing what I know with you today. And I think as, as, as those providers and charities and local authority and the services they provide begin to settle on a way of they might like to work together, then absolutely we need to come back and talk to you about that um, and take that through the relevant governance. Um, so please feel that this is a sharing at a timely point rather than any decisions have been made, I guess is my point. Yeah. Councillor Kirk. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I know I've spoken already and, and I'd just really like to reinforce what some of my fellow councillors have said, but I feel I do have to have it noted to say I am not happy with where we are in this process. And if we don't say it now, we won't get an opportunity to say it. Um, I think it's mainly because we as elected councillors can't be clear about our role in, in accounting to our residents. You know, it makes it extremely hard for us to do that. And we also don't know what changes are going to happen that affect the role of our local authorities and where our, our balance of our balance of power is the wrong word, but we do need to know that local authorities are still going to have an equal influence in these new structures. We don't know at that at the moment. And so personally, for myself as a Bristol councillor, I have to have it minuted that I am not satisfied with this process as it stands at the moment. Uh, we have asked for more detail and I know that you will go away and bring more bring more information to us, but it's extremely vague. It is extremely top down from the government. And um, unfortunately, that doesn't sit well with our role as accountable, um, you know, serving our, our residents and our authorities. So 
I just wanted to have that noted, please. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure that's fine to note. Um, Leo, correct me if I'm wrong. Any that's fine. Cool, thank you, Leo. Anybody else? If not, I think I have magically brought it in almost just before half past. So that's the end of uh, this meeting. Thank you, everybody who has spoken. Um, thank you, uh, colleagues. I will let you all go now. So for those of you with elections, good luck. And for those of you who have not, have a good week. <laughs> thank you very much, Kieran. Well done.